I'm Eric Parker. This morning on CT22, a bill designed to tackle juvenile crime passes in the House after a lot of last minute back and forth. So what's in it? What isn't in it? And why was the road to getting it passed such a bumpy one? Also, you call 911 and you expect an emergency crew will be there to help you quickly, but a shortage of EMS volunteers is making that a bit more difficult. We're digging into the problem that's affecting not just Connecticut, but the whole country. Plus, fostering positive relationships with police. Two Middletown officers join us to share what they're doing to build bonds with the kids in their city. It's all ahead this first day of May. CT22 starts right now. From WFSB, this is CT22 with Eric Parker, sponsored by Hartford Healthcare. Good morning. It was Thursday evening when the state House of Representatives passed the revamped version of a juvenile justice bill, House Bill 5417, by a vote of 129 to 17. Joining me today to talk about what's in the bill and how it's different from the original bill first proposed back in February are Representative Stephen Staffstrom, a Democrat who is chair of the House Judiciary Committee, and Republican Representative Craig Fishbein, one of the sponsors of the bill. Representative Staffstrom, let me start with you. We heard the Speaker of the House midday Thursday say, we're not quite ready for a vote. We're going to all go get coffee and talk about it and hope we get there. You did get there on Thursday. So what happened during the day Thursday to get this done? Yeah, so uh, I think coffee helps, time helps. Um, this has obviously been something we've been working on in a bipartisan fashion for a long time, uh, looking at our juvenile justice system, uh, looking at where there may be places that we should tighten things up or make tweaks to our laws. Uh, and I think we worked hard to get there. Um, Connecticut has a long history of passing bipartisan criminal justice and, and particularly juvenile justice reform dating back 15 years, in which really every juvenile justice reform we've taken as a state has been bipartisan. Uh, and I'm glad we were able to get there on this one as well. And I know there was a lot of uh, back and forth on what would be in the bill, what would not be uh, shorter time to get uh, juvenile suspects to court, some GPS monitoring, better access to records, longer ability to detain. Representative Fishbein, does that go far enough, what ended up in the bill? No, uh, but all compromises, you know, both sides gain um, and both sides lose, so to speak. And, you know, hopefully as a result of this legislation, Ultimately, the residents and citizens of the state of Connecticut benefit by that bipartisan collaboration um, addressing some very serious incidents. Um, you know, one of the things that I would have in the bill is, you know, children that are caught dealing fentanyl. Those cases should be tried in the adult court. Um, you know, cases uh, we're hearing are the catalytic converters and things like that where well, those stops are rampant and certainly uh, repeat offenders. So we should have an escalated um, series of uh, charges related to that. Uh, so those are some of the things. Representative Saftram, a, a lot of the pushback on this bill actually came from members of your own party who felt that it disproportionately affected children of color. How did you overcome those concerns? I know in some cases you didn't. They voted no. But how do you address those concerns? And, and what do you want people to know about what ended up in the bill? If just, you know, Joe Voter is watching this morning, what do you want them to know about it? Yeah, so, Eric, I think the key thing is, I think we all agree we want to keep kids out of prison at all costs, right? I think we know that sending kids to prison actually has an adverse impact on uh, their ability to be rehabilitated and not commit crimes again. I think there are some who fear this bill will lead to more kids being incarcerated. Um, you know, I think while I understand where that fear and that concern is coming from, I actually see it a little bit differently. I think particularly giving police access to monitoring, or giving our courts, I should say, access to GPS monitoring uh, is a uh, alternative to incarceration. And hopefully we can keep kids out of uh, more of a locked, secure facility. What, one of the arguments about that, Representative Staffstrom, was that uh, it doesn't do anything to stop a crime. Uh, you could just know where the juvenile was when that secondary crime occurred. Is, is that still something that, that you felt was important to include, despite those concerns from within your own party? Yeah, look, I mean, you are never going to prevent all crime, right? This came up on, on the debate on Thursday um, on the bill, that you're never going to stop every crime from being from happening, what you want to do is uh, obviously discourage crime as much as possible. And so someone who is known to 
to be, or I should say suspected to be a repeat offender, uh, having some sort of monitoring, some sort of, in addition to services and support for that individual, hopefully will prevent them from recidivating in the future. Representative Fishman, I want to ask you about uh, some of the things that did make it into the bill. You've been on this program a few times in the past and, and called for action. Now there has been some. I, I know we said earlier there are things you'd like to see that didn't make it in there, but what's your message to Joe Voter on this Sunday morning? Is this a positive change? Is there something that, that even if you think it should go farther, maybe in some areas, a couple things you can point to and say you think people should be glad this got done? Absolutely. And I just, I first, you know, on a Sunday morning, I want to share uh, Steve Stavstrom's uh, underlying philosophy that I don't want to see any child go to, to prison or go to jail. Um, you know, but some of the things that are in here, um, giving an officer a 90 day look back period on the uh, juveniles record right there in the field. That's really important for these requests for detention. Uh, right now under the system, an officer has to apply to get access to the record. But right there in the cruiser, they'll be able to see whether or not that juvenile has been arrested, you know, a week before, maybe even the night before uh, for some crime and be able to put that in their report or know to put it, put that report um, or uh, seek that detention order. Uh, one of the most important things is the taking the motor vehicle theft out of the larceny schedule. Um, which really goes to the repeat offenders here. Because right now, let's say a, a juvenile steals four cars with a, a value of $5,000. Right now, under our law, each of those arrests is charged at the same level. Here, we're making the first arrest a Class E felony. And then if there is a subsequent arrest um, and conviction, of course, then it would be a heightened. They, they go up another level. And then if there's another arrest, they go up another level. That's really, really important with regarding, regarding these repeat offenders. Uh, we're also going directly after these serious crimes involving uh, use of a firearm. You know, those we've actually um, almost doubled the maximum penalty that uh, a juvenile would serve with regard to those. So those are some of the highlights, uh, some of the things that the residents of the state of Connecticut can certainly embrace. And we've heard, Representative Fishbein, we had the, the Police Chief Association on, and they said their anecdotal evidence was at times juveniles would be stopped, say, with a stolen car and would almost laugh at the officers. Do you think this solves that part of the problem? I, I don't think it's going to solve children laughing at officers, but um, I think, you know, once a child gets through a diversionary program and they get caught stealing another car, I think they're going to know um, that they'll be facing some serious consequences. You know, the, the, the GPS issue, just to understand, you know, because some do uh, denigrate it, that is not on the first instance. That's a, a juvenile who's been arrested for stealing a car, and then they're out awaiting trial, and they get arrested stealing another car. It's discretionary for a judge to order that, um, that GPS technology. And, and you had asked about our discussions on Thursday. One of the things we were discussing is the back end of that. Um, you know, when can that come off? And uh, the language that we had Thursday morning actually said that it didn't come off until the time of trial, which, you know, in our collaborative efforts, we agreed that the judge should have the discretion to put it on, the judge should have the discretion to take it off. So that's all part of the collaboration of coming to a good resolution here. Representative Stasser, I want to give you the last word on this because there was so much talk from the governor's office about the importance of this bill. Of course, the governor running for re-election, his, uh, his, his opponent has said that, that they, he's going to take action on crime. Was it important to your caucus to get this done for that reason? I don't know that it's because of that reason. I mean, I think it's, it's important for the state of Connecticut to get this done. I think the governor was certainly an active participant all along on this um, from really even before we introduced legislation to some of the administrative changes we made early on, uh, particularly with respect to access to court records. And the governor actually came up with additional funding for police departments to engage in uh, tracking down car thefts and cars that had been stolen. Uh, I think the governor uh, and I share that we actually wish in some respects this bill went further too. Um, it may be different we wish it went further, probably in different ways than, than some of our Republican colleagues might, where 
we wish there was more on preventing illegal guns on our streets and particularly addressing the issue of ghost guns that is plaguing our state. Um, but again, this is a give and take process. And um, and we have to consistent. we have to unfortunately leave it there. Representative Stastrom, we're all out of time. We appreciate you both being with us. We've talked about this issue before and we will again. Thanks for being with us. Coming up later on CT22, we're talking to two local police officers trying to affect their community.